thing up. We're already live. And let's get ready for YouTube. Five, four, three, two, one. Peace and blessings, YouTube. Welcome to another edition of the Bible Show Truth Hour here on the four-time national award-winning POET radio. Our brothers and our sisters are on. We are live. They are sharing as we speak, brothers and sisters. And we thank all of you who support our ministry here at, at, at Team Truth Hour. Today's lesson is the Lord's Holy Day of Atonement. For those of you who, who will be watching this, uh, it is September the 22nd, 2020, and we are approaching in just a few days. This is Tuesday. So at Saturday at sundown, we'll kick off and start the Lord's Holy Day of Atonement, which means that it is the only day of the year that the Lord commands us to fast. I'm going to say that again. It is the only day of the year that the Lord commands us to fast. That means that we have no choice. And if we don't do the thing that he is asking us to do, then we are breaking a commandment of his. And so this is why it is so important. We need to know. We need to understand. We need to realize that we need to come into obedience to his will and his way. No matter what mama said, no matter what daddy said, no matter what pastor or preacher said, brothers and sisters, this is the day that we all must keep. So again, bring out your Bibles and we're going to get into what we believe. Again, we're going to get into the what we believe so that those who are watching for the first time will know and understand what we believe. The Truth Hour Bible Class is an online social media Bible-based ministry. We teach the uncut word of God as it is written in the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept, Isaiah 28 and 10. Our mission is to lead as many souls to Jesus the Christ so that through the word of God and the keeping of his commandments, they may receive salvation. Our motto is, if you cannot read it, then do not believe it. What we believe, number one, we believe in the name of Jesus. And we have no dispute. If you choose to use the Hebrew or the Latin or the Greek version of his name, we have no issue or qualm with that, brothers and sisters. But we prefer to use the English translated version of the name Jesus because our brothers and our sisters speak English. Number two, we believe that Jesus alone is our Lord and Savior. Number three, we believe in the Sabbath day, which is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, and that we must keep that day. Number four, we believe in the seven feast days of the Lord as listed in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And that's what we're going to deal with today. The Lord's day of atonement, the only day of the year that the Lord commands us to fast. No food, no water. From sundown to sundown, starting this sundown, this Saturday at sundown. All right. Uh, number five, we believe that we, the so-called African-American and those who are descendants of the transatlantic slave trade are indeed the Israelites, direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and that the statutes, laws and the commandments apply to us. Number six, we believe that we must still keep the law to the best of our ability according to our knowledge. What do you say to the best of our ability? There are some things that we don't know, brothers and sisters, that we're breaking. You can only be held accountable for that which you know, brothers and sisters. So if it's something that you are doing and we all are doing something that we're not supposed to be doing, some we are knowledgeable of, but some things that we are not knowledgeable of. So the more knowledge we gain, the more that uh, uh, we got to come into compliance and obedience of the law of God. Number seven, we do not believe in eating anything you want to eat because the Lord has a dietary law. And according to that dietary law in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, we must not eat Anything that the Lord deemed to be unclean, such as pork, 
catfish, shrimp, lobster, or anything that's listed in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, that we're not supposed to be eating. Number eight, we believe that both the scriptures or the Old Testament and the testimony or the New Testament must be used when teaching the word of God. You cannot be a New Testament Christian or an Old Testament scholar. You must be both, according to Isaiah 8 and 20. Number nine, we do not believe in Sunday Sabbath service. That's not to say that many of our brothers and sisters go to the Sunday churches. And there may be a time where we may have to go where they are to teach them the truth, to pull them away from that so that they can keep and honor the Sabbath day. We do not believe in the Trinity doctrine. We do not believe in the cross or any images or holidays that originate in the worship of other gods, such as Easter, Christmas, New Year's Day, and any other day. These are anti-Christ according to the Bible. Number 10, we believe that salvation through Jesus the Christ is for all people. So it don't matter what race, color, or nationality you are. If you fall under the blood of Jesus and keep the statutes, laws, and commandments to God, then salvation is for you just as and just as it is for anyone who is a natural born Israelite who keeps the statutes, laws, and the commandments of God, according to Revelation 7 and 9. Now, let's get into our lesson today. The Lord's Day of Atonement. When we look at the feast day of the Lord, we may ask ourselves, what does it mean and what is the purpose of these feast days? The word alone means to make an amends. And I'm talking about the Day of Atonement. The word atone means to make amends or to repair something that you have personally done or that you are personally responsible for. The Day of Atonement is a day in which we are commanded by our God to fast. It is the only day that we are commanded to fast. If we choose to fast any other day of the year, that is up to you and it is personal, but is not a commandment, brothers and sisters. In this lesson, you will find out when it comes or when it is and when it comes to the Day of Atonement, what it is and what the purpose of it is for. Let's start in the book of Leviticus. And if you want to learn about the Lord's holy days or the Lord's feast days, then go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And that's where we're going to start at today. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Let's start where the Lord laid out all of his feast days. Okay. In the 23rd chapter. Not only will you read about the Lord's Day of Atonement, but you will read about all of the other feasts. In total, there are seven feast days. Okay? So we're going to start with Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 and 2. And it reads... And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord. So we read right here, brothers and sisters, that this is not the Jews' feast. This is not Moses' feast. These are the feast of the Lord. And it goes on to say, Which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations or gatherings, even these are my feast. So don't let nobody come to you and say, oh, we don't. That's the Jews feast. You're going to listen to what they say or you're going to listen to what you're reading out of this book called the Bible. Verse three. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So some people say, well, we're not in Jerusalem no more. We're not in Israel no more. We don't have to keep those things. 
Is that what you're saying out of your own mind? Because the Lord is saying it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Verse four, these are the feast of the Lord, even holy convocations, church, sacred assemblies, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. So you can't do these days anytime you want to do them. There is a season attached to the Lord's feast days. So let's go ahead and read down a little bit further. And we're going to pick this thing up at 26 through 32. Leviticus 23, 26 through 32. Because again, we're today we're dealing with the Lord's Day of Atonement. The only day of the year that the Lord commands us to fast. And it's this week, Saturday at sundown to Sunday at sundown. No food, no water, no drink. Now, if you have a medical condition and you have to take a pill or something like that, just take a sip of water with your pill to make sure that you get it in and get it down. But is it, it's a fast, brothers and sisters, right? 26 through 32, we're in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall afflict your souls. That means fast. And offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. We don't do offerings in the, anymore, brothers and sisters, because it was Jesus' sacrifice and offering of his body and the shedding of his blood that replaced the offerings that we would have done before he came. Verse 28, and you shall do no work in the same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now, let me ask the question. Is there anybody that's watching or listening this that don't need to atone for something or, or, or anything that they have done? We all need to atone, brothers and sisters. So this applies to anyone they, that says that they are a Christian or a follower of Christ or that I love the Lord and Jesus is my Lord. And say, anybody that says those things, this applies to you. Verse 29, for whatever soul it be that shall not be afflicted fast in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no matter of work. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So as long as you are having babies, no matter where you live, this is a statue that the Lord put in place that we must follow. Verse 32, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening until evening shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So somebody say, well, black eyes, that said the seventh month of the year. Well, again, we already broke down in previous lessons how the Gentiles came and changed the months of the year. But for those who may have missed that, let me just clarify and go into it real quick. The month of October is spelled O-C-T, O-B-E-R. Any word that begins with O-C-T means eight. Look up the root or the etymology of any word that begins with oct. A stop sign is in the shape of an octagon because it has eight sides. An octopus is called an octopus because it has eight tentacles. October was named October because it was the eighth month of the year. We're in the month of September right now. That would make this month number seven. Nove means nine. So November is the ninth month. Any word that begins with D-E-C means 10. A decathlon is 10 races. Decimal point is rounding to the nearest tenth. A decade is 10 years. D-E-C, D-E-C, D-E-C. So yes, brothers and sisters, 
We're in the seventh month of the year. But again, we don't go by man's calendar. We go by God's calendar. So when that new moon appears, it begins a new month, brothers and sisters. Another lesson for another time, but let's stay on topic. We're talking about the Lord's Day of Atonement. I just wanted to show you something that, so we, we call that learning something on the way to learning something. Turn your Bibles to Exodus, the 29th chapter. Let's get right in the beginning when it was introduced. Why would we need atonement in the first place? Again, in previous lessons, we talked about the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. From that moment, no flesh and blood human has been sin free with the exception of Jesus. It said that he came in sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. Let's go back to the purpose of the atoning, atoning in the first place. Exodus, the 29th chapter. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Exodus, the 29th chapter. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3. Exodus 29. Verses 1 through 3. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hollow them. To minister unto me in the priest's office, take one young bullock and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and cakes. Now, last week we did a show called the goat, the lamb, the ram and the lion. And we showed you that the goat represented Jesus. The lamb represented Jesus. The ram in the bush represented Jesus. So when it talks about sacrificing a ram and a bullock and a goat, those things represented Jesus before he came. Verse two, and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened tempered with oil and wafers unleavened anointed with oil. Oil uh, of wheaten flour shall thou make them. And thou shalt put them into one basket and bring them in the basket with the bullock and two rams. Okay? What are we going to do with this? Let's go down to verse 33. We're in the book of Exodus, the 29th chapter. Let's go to verse 33. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made. So see, these rams and these bullocks and those things were sacrificed. Blood was shed. They were killed, many of them. As an atonement for sin. Verse 33 again. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made. To consecrate and to sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. Let's continue our lesson. We're talking about the Lord's Day of Atonement. What does it mean? What does it represent? What does it stand for? Let's go to the book of 1 John, the third chapter. Atonement and sin are joined together and there would be no more need for atonement if there was no more sin. You know how people say, oh, there ain't no law no more. Jesus came and did away with the law. Mm -hmm. If there was no more law, there could be no more sin because sin is breaking of the law. So let's go ahead and read the Bible's definition of sin, not your brother's definition, your uncle's definition, or somebody else's definition. Let's read the Bible's definition of what sin is. 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4. 1 John, the third chapter. Verses 1 through 4, and it reads, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and do not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So remember when Jesus comes back, 
the first resurrection takes place. So those who are dead and die in Christ will be resurrected. And those who are alive will be instantly changed in a moment, in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye. So what are you going to be changed from and what are you going to be changed to? You're going to be changed out of this flesh and blood body into a spirit body. And then we shall be like him. Verse 3. And every man that have this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever commits sin transgressive or breaks also the law. For sin is the transgressing or the breaking of the law. So where there is no law, there is no sin. Understand that, brothers and sisters. Don't let nobody come and tell you that there is no more law. Jesus did away with the law, with his sacrifice. The law that Jesus did away with was the law of animal sacrifice. You can read that on your own in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. But yes, we still cannot steal. We still cannot kill and do any of those other things that the Lord commanded us not to do, brothers and sisters. Because there's a law that says we can't do it. And if we do those things, then we commit sin. So again, the only reason why sin is still in existence is because there are laws that are being broken. Let's get back to our lesson. Everywhere you read, about atonement, you will run into sin. You can't have one without the other. Let's go to Leviticus, the fourth chapter. Leviticus, the fourth chapter. Leviticus, the fourth chapter. And then we're going to go down to 20. Leviticus, the fourth chapter. And we'll go down to verse 20. And it reads, and he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this. And the priest shall make an atonement for them. And it shall be forgiven. So again, the blood of the animal at that time was being shed to make an atonement for our sins. What do you think the shedding of Jesus' blood did for us? It made an atonement. For our sins. Let's go down to verse 26. And he shall burn all his fat upon the altar. As the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin. And it shall be forgiven him. So. This sin. This atonement. Is connected to sacrifice. What are you and I willing to sacrifice this Saturday at sundown? Are we willing to give up food? Are we willing to give up water? Are we willing to fast like the Lord commands us to do? Are we willing to not do any work on that day? That's our sacrifice. That's the least that we can do for someone who gave his life for ours. To atone for the sin that he didn't even commit himself. For the sins that we committed. Let's go down to verses 31. And then we'll read 35 after 31. 31 then 35. And it reads. And he shall take away all the fat thereof. As the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of a peace offering. And the priest shall burn it. Upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven of him. 35. And he shall take away all the fat thereof. As the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he has committed and it shall be forgiven him. So you think that the priests don't need to atone for anything that he has done? In many cases, brothers and sisters, the priests are worse than those who go and listen to the priest. He needs atonement too. But let's talk about from the blood of an animal to the blood of Jesus. 
Because we've been talking about animals up until this point and how they sacrifice animals as sin offerings for our atonement. But let's go from the blood of an animal to the blood of Jesus. Walk with me. Let's take this journey, brothers and sisters. Let's go to Genesis, the third chapter. For the first time in the Bible, we can read about animal sacrifice for sin. It was shown to us in the Garden of Eden. God showed us, after reading this book, that when Adam and Eve covered themselves with those fig leaves, that wasn't good enough. But they were smart enough to know that they could not sin by killing an animal or anything in God's creation. So God is instituting something at this point, brothers and sisters, that man would be given the permission to do at a later time. Again, man wouldn't even give him permission to do what God is about to do. So let's go to Genesis, the third chapter. And we're going to read one and then seven. Genesis, the third chapter. We're going to start at verse one. And then we're going to go down to verse seven. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which God, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, have God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So you know what happened. They listened to Satan the devil. They ate of the fruit of his lies. And then what happened? Verse 7. And the eyes of them were both open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 11. And the Lord said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree where I commanded you that you should not eat from? They knew that they had messed up, brothers and sisters. That's why they tried to cover themselves. But let's go down to verse, uh, let's see, verse 21 and read what God did in order to not kill them. This is what God did. And unto Adam, also to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. Where did he get the coats of skin from? It was the sacrificing of an animal, brothers and sisters. God got the coat of the animal skin and he clothed them or covered them, brothers and sisters, their private parts, with that skin that he took from that animal whose blood he shed to atone for their sin, brothers and sisters. You see how long atonement has been going on? Since the beginning of the creation of man. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, the 17th chapter. Turn your Bible to the book of Leviticus, the 17th chapter. For those who just tuned in, you tuned in to the Bible show Truth Hour. We're talking about the Lord's Day of Atonement. It starts this Saturday at sundown and it goes to Sunday at sundown. And we are commanded to fast on this day. No food, no drink, brothers and sisters. This is a commandment. Let's go to Leviticus, the 17th chapter. From the first act of animal sacrifice that was done by the Lord, it has been condoned by the Lord for man until the sacrifice of Jesus came. It was never about the body. It was always about the blood, brothers and sisters. Let's go to Leviticus, the 17th chapter, verse 11. Leviticus 17 and 11, and it reads, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. And this is why we stress coming under the blood of Jesus. Just like we put the blood of the lamb on the side posts and the door post, and as long as we were under that blood and in that house, we remained alive and we avoided the death angel. Well, the Lord wants you to avoid the lake of fire. 
He wants us to avoid the lake of fire. So the only way that we can avoid the lake of fire is to stay under the blood of Jesus. Nothing new, brothers and sisters. Let's go ahead and keep on with our lesson, brothers and sisters. Let's go ahead to the book of Joel, to, to the book of Joel, the second chapter. To the book of Joel, the second chapter. We're talking about the Lord's Day of Atonement. This is the only day of the year that the Lord commands us to fast. And that don't just mean fast the way you want to fast. It means fast the way that the Lord prescribed us to do it. Atonement not only came with animal sacrifice, but it also came with personal sacrifice. Again, fasting, denying yourself and afflicting your soul is what teaches us discipline of the flesh. So let's go to Joel, the second chapter. Let's read two verses, 12 and 13. Joel, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13. And it reads, therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. So the Lord always wants us to come back to him. He always wants us to turn around and change our ways and go in a different direction. But you can't even do that if you don't have the knowledge to do that, brothers and sisters. And this is why it's so important to read the word of God, because through reading the word of God, we gain that knowledge. And then we begin to know and understand what the Lord wants us to do and what the Lord does not want us to do. Let's go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And again, let's find out that thing that Jesus did take away. That law that Jesus did take away. So you can get full and complete understanding that he didn't take away the law. And that's everything. But he did take away the law of animal sacrifice. So there are no more offerings and sacrifices that we have to do anymore because his sacrifice replaced those things. But we still can't kill. We still got a dietary law to keep. We still got a Sabbath day to keep. We still got the Lord's holy feast days to keep. Because these are the things that are instituted forever. The animal sacrifice. Let's read about what that was. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 1. And we're going to read down. For the law. Again, the law of animal sacrifice, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices. Which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But because these were animals being sacrificed, they couldn't take away your sins. They only covered your sin. So we had to do those constantly year by year. Three, but in those sacrifices, see how we're talking about a law and everything under this law that we're talking about deals with sacrifices and offerings. It's beautiful to say that you love Jesus and that he's your Lord and Savior and that he's my friend and I love him and I know him. But you can't have those things without knowing what his word says, brothers and sisters. Verse three. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Why are we reading about sacrifices? Mm -hmm. Attached to a law. I think you are beginning to get the picture and beginning to understand that this law is the law of animal sacrifice. Let's go ahead and read though. And let's find out why God had no pleasure in these things. Verse five. 
Wherefore, when he comes into the world, talking about Jesus, he said, sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared for me. So he didn't care about sacrificing animals for our sins. They didn't do nothing to die for us. Innocent animals we're taking the life of because of our sins. Verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin... Thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Uh-oh. Now we understand that this offering was done by the law, the law of animal sacrifice. Number nine. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, animal sacrifice, that he may establish the second, the sacrifice of himself. By the which... Will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He took away animal sacrifice and replaced it with his own sacrifice. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This is why we need atonement. Jesus ain't coming to die for us no more, brothers and sisters. So we got to atone for our own sins that we commit on a daily basis. Fasting is a test, but with that test is going to come temptation because those of you who are joining us this Saturday at sundown for this 24-hour fast or a sundown to sundown fast, during that fast, you're going to become irritable, you're going to become cranky, and you're not even supposed to let anybody know that you are fasting. You're not even supposed to look like. You're fasting so that somebody can say, oh, what's wrong with you? I want sympathy now. No, brothers and sisters. Let's read Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Fasting and prayer are the best ways to open up the direct line to the Father. It is the best way to learn how to control the appetite of the flesh. It is the best way to arm yourself against Satan. And again, you can't get to the Father unless you go through Jesus. But how many things do we have to go through between us and Jesus before we even get to him? Let's read Isaiah 58 chapter. Isaiah 58 chapter verses 1 through 5. Isaiah the 58 chapter. Verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 58. Verses 1 through 5. And it reads. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And show my people their transgressions. And the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. And delight to know my ways. As a nation, they did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask for me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted? Say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? And thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and, ex and exact all your labors. So while your stomach is hurting, while you feeling irritable, while you feeling cranky, while you become hungry and thirsty, find pleasure and know and understand that you are doing the will of God. All these things that you will be going through in your mind 
in your, in your soul or body, and even in your spirit, brothers and sisters. All these things that you will be going through will be well worth the sacrifice to be in compliance with the law of God. Verse 3, verse 4, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. It is such a fast that I have chosen. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? It is such a fast that I have chosen. A day for a man to afflict a soul. It is to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Wilt thou call this a fast? And an acceptable day of the Lord? Six, it is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands and wickedness to do unto the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Brothers and sisters, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and thou hast brought um, bring thou poor and, and that are cast out of thy house when thou seest the naked and thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself thine own flesh brothers and sisters the Lord is trying to weaponize us and you got to understand that it seems like oh man I'm missing out on fun everybody is doing this and everybody the Lord wants to sanctify you which means to set you apart you ain't supposed to be doing what everybody else is doing Israel hear my voice listen well you are not supposed to be doing what everybody else is doing what the other nations are doing you're not supposed to be doing that the Lord wants to sanctify you he wants to set you apart. He wants to weaponize you so that you can be created as a weapon for him against Satan. Let's turn your books of the Bible to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Let's read about Jesus. When he fasted and the Lord ain't even asking you to do what Jesus did because Jesus fasted. For 40 days and 40 nights. When you are afflicting your soul or fasting. Again, all kinds of subliminal messages come to your mind in your weakened state. Remember, the devil has no off days. He don't need no sleep. He don't take no breaks. He will tempt you. And always remember, Satan tempts you. But God tests you. Satan is the one who tempts you. But God is the one who tests you. Let's read about Jesus. Matthew the fourth chapter. Start at verse one through 11. Then it was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he, would, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made of bread. But he answered and said unto him, is it not written, man shall not live off bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Did y'all hear that? We got to lock on hold to all these words that we are reading, brothers and sisters, because we got to hold on to every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And it said, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on high on a pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands, they shall bear thee up. Lest any time you dash your foot against a stone. But look at how Jesus answered him. Jesus said unto him, is it written? It is written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 
That's the second time. So you think the devil going to let up on you? Satan ain't done. He about to come back to Jesus one more time. And the devil taketh him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. It is written that you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall thou serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So brothers and sisters, know and understand that yes, Jesus got weak too. And know and understand that you are going to get weak too and that Satan is going to come to you too when you are fasting. And he's going to cause you to want to have an attitude against somebody. Because you're going to be hangry. Hungry slash angry. You're going to be hangry. But you got to check that spirit. That's what this is all about. Controlling yourself. Becoming the master of the lower nature of yourself. That appetite, that stomach. If you can deny yourself that which you crave most when you are hungry then you can deny yourself the lust of the flesh. We got to get control over these things, brothers and sisters. And this is the way that the Lord set these things in place in order for us to get it right. Okay? In order for us to get it right. Let's go to the book of Revelations, the seventh chapter. The book of Revelations, the second chapter. The book of Revelations, the seventh chapter. When it comes when Jesus comes back and starts this thousand year reign, there would be a great end gathering. The Feast of Tabernacles. Right? Let's go to Revelation is the seventh chapter, verses one through three. Revelation is the seventh chapter, verses one through three. And it reads, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor of any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the earth, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, of course, when you read down, you understand that 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel were sealed, which is 144,000. So let's go down to verse 11 and read it. And it said, And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the, el uh, about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Let's go up to verse 9 and read about who else came in addition to these 144,000 Israelites. And after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, and stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Brothers and sisters, this is where we are trying to get to. And these are the steps and the process that God has put in place in order for us to get to the Lamb, brothers and sisters. Let's go to the book, back to the book of Jeremiah. Let's go back to the book of Jeremiah and ask the question, why aren't these pastors teaching this? Why aren't they teaching their congregation to keep these Lord's feast days? The Lord said, be careful of the pastors who are not teaching his words, brothers and sisters. I'm sorry, Sister Key Israel, we're not going to go to Jeremiah the 20. Third chapter, let's go a different place. Again, why aren't these pastors 
teaching his word. I'm sorry that it, yep, Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm tweaking, as the young folks say. Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 3. Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, 1 through 3. I had a conversation with my brother the other day, and I said, no, the Lord is not sending these pastors who are telling you to do something different or the opposite of what God is telling you to do. He's telling you to keep his commandments. They're saying you ain't got to do that no more. The Lord is telling you to keep his Sabbath day. They're saying, well, you ain't got to do that no more. They antichrist. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4, and it reads, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Brothers and sisters, The Lord having sent these pastors that are teaching you that you don't need to keep the things that he told you to keep, brothers and sisters. So we have to be mindful and careful of these things. Let's go down to verse 21 in that same Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verse 21. And it reads, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken unto them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Jeremiah 23, verses 21 and 22. Just because somebody is dressed up in a three-piece suit, just because someone is loquacious or speaks, speaks eloquently. Brothers and sisters, God put this word down so that even a fool could understand this word. I don't care how many degrees you have. If you telling me to do something and I'm reading for myself, God telling me not to do it or you not you telling me not to do something and I'm reading that God is telling me to do it, then I got to go with what God said. Plain and simple. Turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles, the 6th chapter. We believe in the God of this book. We believe in the prophets of this book. We believe in the scriptures and have faith that these words are faithful and true. Some have watched this Bible show Truth Hour and wondered, why is that when, when, when these brothers pray, they stand, turn, and pray towards the east? Our homeland, Jerusalem, is in the east. Israel is in the east. And King Solomon petitioned to God that if we prayed towards the east, the place where he chose to place his name, Jerusalem, that if we prayed, he would hear our prayer. Let's go to 2 Chronicle, the 6th chapter. 2 Chronicle, the 6th chapter, verses 34 through 39. 2 Chronicle, the 6th chapter, verses 34 through 39. And it reads, If your people go out to war against their enemies by the way that thou shalt send them, and they pray unto thee towards this city, which you have chosen, and the house which I have built for you, in your name. Then hear thou from the heavens their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there is no man which sinneth not, and you be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies which the Lord has done to us. This is why we're in America today. This is why we're in Jamaica. This is why we're in the islands. 
because the Lord gave us over to our enemy. And they carry them away captives unto a land far off or near. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land where they are carried captive and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done amiss and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they have carried them captives and pray towards their land and pray towards their land and pray towards the east, their land which thou gavest unto their fathers and toward the city, which thou hast chosen and towards the house, which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou from heaven, from the heavens, even from your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive thy people, which have sinned against thee. This is why we stand and pray towards the east. This is not a commandment, but this is a petition that King Solomon made on our behalf, brothers and sisters. So now that you have understanding of that and know where to go and find it in the book, understand that this is why we do what we do, brothers and sisters. But again, atonement for sin. Prayer and supplication and fasting for sin. This is what the Day of Atonement is all about. Despite the things that we have done against the Lord or the things that we are doing, when the Lord comes, he will plead with us to atone and turn back to him. Now, when we say plead, brothers and sisters, we ain't talking about begging. We're talking about get down or lay down. There's <laughs> only one choice. Remember, he left as a lamb, but he's coming back as a lion. Let's go to Jeremiah, the second chapter. Jeremiah, the second chapter. And we're going to read verses one through nine. Jeremiah, the second chapter. And we're going to read verses one through nine. And it reads, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine uh, apostles, which thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my inheritance in a an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that had handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after the things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. So the Lord is going to give us an opportunity when he comes back to turn back to him. Many of us don't even know because we've been lied to so much by false prophets what the Lord wants us to do and what the Lord does not want us to do. 
brothers and sisters, Satan can use anybody. So you might say, well, my pastor got a good heart and I love my pastor. Satan could be using him. He could be using your mom. He could be using your grandma. They don't know. Satan used Peter. When Jesus told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, that was Jesus' chief apostle. And he walked with Jesus. He knew the statutes, laws, and the commandments, and Satan, Satan still used him. What makes you think Satan can't use these people who've been teaching you? You got unwilling participants, and then you have willing participants. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. We got two more places. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, verses 33 through 38. And it reads, As I live, saith the Lord, surely with the mighty hand and with the stretched out arm and with fury pured out, I will rule over you. And I will bring you out of the from the people and will gather you out of the countries where you are scattered. How do you think you got in America again? How do you think you got in Jamaica again? How do you think you got in Belize? How do you think you got in the Dominican Republic? How do you think you got in the European nations? The Lord scattered you there. But the Lord said, with a stretched out arm, I will gather my people with a mighty hand. He said, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. And will bring you into the bond of the covenant. So why are you telling me to not do something? You ain't got to worry about that old law. That old covenant. And the Lord is constantly saying, I'm going to plead with you to bring you back into that which you have walked away from. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. And, and, and I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So the Lord in the wilderness, brothers and sisters, when we come out of America and the various places, not one Israelite is going to be left where they don't belong. But in the wilderness, you're going to be tried and pleaded with. And the only way you're going to make it back into the land is to come back under the blood of Jesus and come into the bond of the covenant. Verse 39, as for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Go ye, serve ye every one his idols. And hereafter also, if you will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye me, ye, ye my holy name, no more with your gifts and with your idols. So the Lord ain't playing, brothers and sisters. If you want to do what you're doing, the Lord is saying, keep doing it. I got a place for you. It's called the lake of fire. But if you atone, the day of atonement, if you purge your sins, if you afflict your fast that I am commanding you to do and make this lifestyle change that I am commanding you to make, then you can enter into the kingdom of God, which will be established here on earth. Let's close this thing out. Revelations, the 21st chapter, verses two and three. Finally, after the last enemy is defeated, which is death, the eighth day or the coming of the father takes place. No more flesh and blood. According to Leviticus 23 and 42, we only have seven days to dwell in this flesh and blood body or 7,000 years. But at the beginning of the eighth day, every living soul must be changed in a moment. In an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, brothers and sisters. So again, we atone so that we can be accepted into the body of Christ and gathered together in that Feast of Tabernacles. 
And once we're gathered together, and when Jesus is done doing everything that he has to do, then he turns over the keys of the kingdom to the Father, and then the Father himself comes down. Let's close this out and read it. Revelation is the 21st chapter, verses 2 and 3. So again, don't teach that we go into heaven. That is not biblical, brothers and sisters. That is antichrist to teach that we are going to heaven to be with the Lord. Let's read what the word of God says, because the word of God says the exact opposite. Revelations 21, verses 2 and 3. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So first he sends his kingdom down here. And it says it was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Who prepared it? Didn't Jesus say, I go to prepare a place for you? Verse three, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, look, the tabernacle of God is with men. Where are men, brothers and sisters? On this earth. So the house of God, the tabernacle of God, the kingdom of God is coming down to be established on this earth. But where will God be? It says, and he, talking about God, will live with them, talking about us. So God is coming with his kingdom to live with us. Let me read on more. And they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. It didn't say we're going to be with God. It says God is coming to be with them, with us, man. Male and female, woe man, and be our God. So how can we turn around and ask who wants to go to heaven when we're reading this right here, that what is in heaven is coming down here to be established here on this earth? Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you like Malcolm X said, you've been had, you've been took, you've been hoodwinked, you've been led astray, you've been run amok. But this is what Satan does. He's a copycat. He is a master of deception. And this is why we need to atone. This is why we need to fast. And this is why we need to pray, brothers and sisters. Because walking this walk for the straight and narrow is hard. Wide is the way to destruction, is the road to destruction. Everybody is walking that road. But what are you going to do for Jesus, knowing that he died for you? Can you at least keep his statutes, laws, and his commandments? Can you at least on this Saturday keep his commandment of following his holy day of atonement and fast? And let's encourage one another and check on one another to do this fast, brothers and sisters. And not only are we going to fast, brothers and sisters, but at 12 noon, Central Standard Time, we're going to tune in to the Israel of God because the other thing that's stated is that we must have a holy convocation, which means a holy gathering or church, a sacred assembly. So not only are you commanded to fast at the time that the Chicago Bears football game come on, playing the Atlanta Falcons, and I will be in Atlanta this Thursday. Can't watch the game. Got to have that holy convocation or that holy assembly, brothers and sisters. That is the other part of keeping the Holy Day of Atonement. I thank you so much for your time. I thank you for tuning in, brothers and sisters. I look forward to keeping this Holy Day of Atonement and this fast with you this Saturday at sundown. Two Sabbaths, back to back. You can do it, brothers and sisters. I have faith in our God and I have faith in you. Pray that God strengthen your faith and your will, brothers and sisters. With that being said, for those who are watching via YouTube, if you would like to um, be added to our text message invite reminder list, then text your name and the keyword truth hour to 312-719-7310. And somebody please put that number in the comment section for me. Again, for those who are on YouTube or Facebook, 
If you would like to be added to our text message invite reminder list, then text your name and the keyword Truth Hour to 312-719-7310. For those who are on Facebook, please go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel, Truth Hour TV. For those who are on YouTube, go and like our Facebook page, which is the Truth Hour Bible Show. And again, Let me go ahead and put this uh, number here, 312-719-7310. If you would like to be added to our text message, invite reminder list, there you go. And if there is someone on the line that would like to comment on something that was said today, then we're going to give you an opportunity to call in. As we stand up and say our prayer, we're going to give you an opportunity to call into the show and to tell us what you thought about today's lesson. That number is 605-562-0444. 605-562-0444. And... That's being put in the comment section right now as we speak. All right. And again, if you are in Atlanta, I will be in Atlanta this Thursday. And I will be leaving on Sunday. All right. So let's go ahead and stand up. Face the east, y'all. Face the east. And get this prayer in. And again, um, please call in now. That number right there. You only sitting on the couch anyhow. Y'all remember the commercial, the college commercial. All right, y'all, let's stand up and face the east and pray. Father God, we come to you once again, Father God. We say thank you, Father God. Thank you for another powerful lesson, Father God. Anytime that we are reading and teaching your word, Father God, we know that it is going to be powerful, Father God. Let that power transcend to your sheep, Father God, those who are watching, those who are listening, those who desire to do your will, Father God, in their life and on this earth, Father God. Let the power of your word transcend to them, Father God. We ask that you strengthen us, Father God. We know that this fast coming up for your holy day of atonement, it won't be an easy thing to do, Father God, for it is not natural for us to deny ourselves food and drink when we are hungry, Father God. But you are asking us not to do the natural thing, but to do the unnatural thing or the spiritual thing, Father God, which is to afflict our souls. And it's for your glory, Father God, and for those who are um, watching, it's for their edification, Father God. We know that we can't do it without you, Father God. We're asking you for your help, Father God, your strength, Father God, strengthen our will and strengthen our spirit, Father God. And let us be there for one another at the end of the day. We ask these things in your son, Jesus, Yeshua name. It is, it is in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson today. Let's see if we have anyone on the, on the phone line. Let's see if we have anyone on the phone line. We have 773-808. 773-808. Um, brother, tell us where you are calling from and what's your name. 773-808. Call us, state your name and where you're calling from. Uh, this is Duncan Ellerton calling from Riverdale, Illinois. All right, my brother, um, you had a comment on the lesson tonight? Uh, I was basically digesting all of the lessons. Uh, something crossed my mind uh, during the lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of it right now. But, uh, yeah, so thing is, is, this, uh, oh, yeah, which is uh, the atonement of this is a commandment once a year. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> so this uh, this commandment once a year, uh, that uh, atones for your sin. I mean, you see.
still have to, after, after you make the atonement and, the, and, and obey the commandment, it basically helps you to be more purified and want to love and obey the commandments. But at the same time, does it eradicate your sin of forgiveness from uh, before that day that you do the, the fast and the atonement? Well, it is asking for forgiveness in the name of Jesus, um, our Lord and Savior, that forgives your sins. It is asking for that forgiveness. Um, this is uh -huh. a ceremony. This is a um, <clears throat> a commandment of a Sabbath day. So uh -huh. let's look at the Sabbath day weekly that we do from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. On that day, we pray. Right. Um, we ask the Lord for forgiveness. We atone um, that day as well, but we don't fast that particular day. Um, we're not commanded to fast. If you do fast, that is your choice. But this day, what makes this holy day so sacred is what is being asked of us to do on this particular day. Now, everything on the weekly Sabbath is being asked of us to do on the day of atonement. The only thing that is asked of us to do differently on this particular day is to fast. And again, this okay. is a commandment, but what it represents, um, Brother Duncan, is um, the, again, the atonement for our sins, but also what how Jesus was afflicted for the sins of man. This is us afflicting ourselves for our own sins. So it is a representative of Jesus afflicting himself for the sins of the world. So right. if he did that for us, then we should be able okay. to do this for ourselves. Right, right. Okay. And it also, again, it also represents that when he comes back and returns before we can go into the land, then there are some things that we must um, turn away from. So all of that atonement, you know, it's a setup before what comes after it, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the great ingathering. So he's going to gather us from the four corners of the earth. But he's not bringing us right into the land. We got to go into the wilderness before we go into the land. And it is in that wilderness that we must give up the lifestyle and the life of the countries that we came from. Because that lifestyle is not necessarily conducive to the lifestyle that the Lord wants us to lead or um, live once we come back into the land. Okay. Yep. Okay, and I'm pretty sure we'll talk on it uh, more as well. All right, then. God bless you. Thank you. And may the God continue to share the word and have that labor and endurance of love for all who are willing to hear. And Yasha, in Jesus' name. All right, in Jesus' Amen. name. Thank you, brother. Uh, let's see if there's anyone else who wants to comment. And... Um, I guess not. So we will close this thing out. And again, brothers and sisters, let's encourage one another. Um, you can reach out to me in my inbox or any of the Team Truth Hour inbox. And let us help each other and encourage each other. Team Truth Hour, this is what I want you to do so that they can find you. Please type Team Truth Hour under your name. So um, that they know that if they need help, they can reach out to you during this fast. Okay. Or if they need more information. All right. And again, if you would like to be a member of Team Truth Hour, uh, of course, we could always use the help. Um, then reach out to anyone that is putting in the comment section Team Truth Hour um, under their name. And um, we will get with you and see if you are willing to help further this mission and further this ministry, brothers and sisters. We need you. God needs you. So faith without works is dead. Listening to people all throughout the course of the day, that's one thing. But what are we doing? What work are we putting in? So <clears throat> let's put some work in. Share this lesson. Invite your family members and your friends on to watch, on to listen. And let's get this word out. Peace and blessings, brothers and sisters.
Amen. Amen.